For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 1B, where I will be discussing the photon random walk. In this video, I will go over the photon mean free path, then the photon random walk time, and why this model of photons in stars is not very accurate. I've rated the physics level in this video as easiest. Recall from Stellar Physics 1A that stars are powered by hydrogen fusion in their cores. This is when four hydrogen nuclei, or protons, and two electrons are converted into a helium nucleus, otherwise called an alpha particle. In this process, energy is released in the form of photons, otherwise called gamma rays, as well as neutrinos. We don't really care about the neutrinos right now, they just leave the star and are essentially just lost energy. The photons, however, dump their energy into the star. The energy release comes from the fact that the four protons and the two electrons have a greater mass than the alpha particle. And so the energy release is just the energy corresponding to this mass defect. Stars are made up of an ionized gas, also called a plasma. This means that each nucleus is surrounded by a sea of electrons. So when a photon is emitted from a nucleus, it will encounter these electrons and scatter from one electron to another. So when a photon is released inside of a star, it will randomly scatter from one electron to another, meandering its way around inside of the star until it eventually reaches its surface. At that point, it will free stream into empty space. This meandering trajectory is called the photon random walk. And we're going to calculate how long it takes for a photon created in the center of the star to random walk its way to its surface. In order to do this, we need to know the average distance a photon will travel before scattering off an electron. This is called the photon mean free path. Imagine we have a volume filled with some uniform density of electrons. Let's say the width of this volume is r. And let's say we have some initial number of photons traveling through this volume, which I'm going to call n naught. Now let's ask, after a distance dx, how many photons remain? Meaning, how many photons have not scattered off of electrons? This is equivalent to asking, how many of the initial photons will pass through this cross-sectional area A after a distance dx? Let's say the probability of one photon passing through this cross-sectional area is p. Then the number of photons remaining will be the initial number times 1 minus p. Now we're going to repeat this process for another distance dx. Once again, the number of photons will be reduced by a factor of 1 minus p. So we're left with the initial number of photons times 1 minus p squared. Now we repeat this process until we've gone a distance r, each time reducing the number of photons by a factor of 1 minus p. If it takes k steps to go a distance r, then the number of photons remaining will be the initial number times 1 minus p to the k. Since it took k steps to go a distance r, we have that k equals r divided by dx. Since p is the probability that a photon will scatter off of an electron in one of these steps, that probability is simply going to be the number of electrons in the volume corresponding to this length dx times the cross sectional area of an electron divided by the cross sectional area of the volume. Now, the thing is, electrons don't actually have a cross-sectional area. They're point particles. So instead, what we're using here is called the Thomson cross-section. This cross-section is a quantum mechanical object, and even though it doesn't actually represent the physical size of an electron, you can think of it as a target centered around an electron that a photon has to hit in order to have a reasonable chance of scattering off of it. I'm not going to derive this cross section. I'll just tell you that it's about 6.5 times 10 to the minus 25 square centimeters. Now I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this by dx. And notice that this quantity here on the bottom in the numerator, a times dx, well, that's just this volume of one of the steps. Right? It's got a cross sectional area dx, a cross sectional area a, and a length dx. So Ne, which is the number of electrons in this volume, divided by the volume is just the number density of electrons. Now let's take a look at this quantity here, the number density times the cross-section. 
This has units of one over length. So I'm gonna define the length scale, which I'm gonna call lambda, as one over this quantity. Now that we have an expression for p, I'm also gonna replace k with r over dx to get the number of photons remaining as a function of distance. I'm now gonna define the quantity q as dx divided by lambda. This gives me the following expression for n of r. Now what we wanna do is take the limit as this step size dx goes to zero. This corresponds to taking the limit as q goes to zero. The limit of this quantity inside of the brackets is simply the definition of one over e. So this bracket raised to the r over lambda is simply e to the negative r over lambda. If we integrate this over r from zero to infinity, we find that the average distance of photon will travel is lambda. And so we have just found that the photon mean free path is one over the electron density times the Thomson cross section. In this analysis for the mean free path, there's nothing special about electrons and photons. In general, the mean free path of anything traveling through a medium will be one over the number density of targets times its corresponding cross section. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a couple friends. Now that we have the mean free path, we can figure out the photon random walk time. However, there's a little bit of a problem. When photons scatter off electrons, they scatter in a random direction. So photons are just as likely to go up as down, left as right, or in as out. And so on average, their mean displacement will be zero. So instead, we're gonna look at the displacement squared, because this is always a positive quantity. After one step, the displacement squared will simply be the sum of each component squared. After two steps, we again just sum the components and square them. We can repeat this process n times to find the mean displacement squared after n steps. I'm gonna rearrange these sums by first grouping all of the squared terms together and then grouping the cross terms together. Notice that in the second sum, I'm taking i to be not equal to j. Since each step is independently distributed and has a mean displacement of zero, the cross terms are also on average zero. And so this entire second sum averages out to zero. The first sum will simply average out to lambda squared. And so we have that the average displacement squared after n steps is just n times lambda squared. Since we're going from the center of the star to its surface, we want this to equal the radius of the star squared. The total path length traveled by the photon, which I'm gonna call d, will be the mean free path times the number of steps, which I'm gonna rewrite as r squared divided by lambda. The time it will take for a photon to travel along this path will just be the path length divided by the speed of light. And so we have that the photon random walk time is the stellar radius squared divided by the photon mean free path divided by the speed of light. We've already found that one over the mean free path is the number density of electrons times the Thompson cross section. The number density of electrons will be the density of the star divided by the average nuclear mass times the average nuclear charge. A here is the atomic number, Z is the atomic charge, and MP is the mass of a proton. This holds because the star is electrically neutral, so there's one electron for every proton. I've rewritten here Z over A as YE. I've done this because this quantity YE, which is called the electron fraction, comes up a lot in astrophysics. It's always a number between zero and one. For normal stars, it's typically between 0.6 and 0.7. In the case of the sun, the density is about one gram per cubic centimeter. So plugging all the numbers in, in the case of the sun, the photon random walk time is about 3,000 years. So a photon emitted in the sun's core will take about 3,000 years to get to its surface. There are a few problems with this analysis. First, it's important to note this is a very rough estimate. For one thing, the density of a star is not constant. It decreases with radius. So to get a better estimate, you'd have to integrate over the density profile of a star. But we won't know what that is until we discuss the internal structure of stars. Third, and this is very important, the random walk time is not the time it takes for energy released in the stellar core to reach the star's surface. 
there are three forms of energy transport, radiation, convection, and conduction. This analysis would work for radiation only. Typically, stars have radiative cores and convective outer layers. So this would hold only for the inner part of the star. After that, once you get to the convective layers, heat is transferred more efficiently through convection. As a general rule, the more massive the star is, the larger the convective zones. To the point that if a star is very massive, it becomes entirely convective. Somewhat ironically, these stars are also referred to as radiation-dominated stars, but that's because they're supported by radiation pressure. We'll see more about that in the future as well. Fourth, and this is also very important, photons leaving the star's surface are created at the star's surface. They're not created in the center of the star and then meander their way in this random walk until they can finally leave the star. It is a common misconception that when nuclear fusion first takes place in the star, it will take a random walk time for the star to turn on, meaning for it to start shining. But photon number is not a conserved quantity, and any material with a non-zero temperature will emit photons. So by the time the star has reached nuclear fusion, the star will already be hot, and so it will be emitting photons. The random walk time just gives you a rough idea of how long it takes for radiation transport. This brings us to another problem. Where exactly is the star's surface? Well, it's not very well defined. Stars don't actually have a clear surface. They're just balls of gas that progressively decrease in density until they fizzle out. Now, in this video, I've in a sense implicitly defined the stellar surface as the radius where photons become free streaming. And in my experience, that's more or less how astronomers define the stellar surface. But that too is not very well defined. There is no radius at which photons become free streaming. Because the density decreases with radius, the photon mean free path increases with radius. So in reality, the probability that a photon will free stream out of the star increases with radius. But there is no point in the star where the material transitions from being opaque to photons to transparent to photons. It's gradual. Sixth problem with this analysis. Photons are not like pinballs bouncing around from one electron to another. That's kind of a classical analysis, but photons are quantum mechanical objects. In fact, there actually are no photons inside of stars. This is one of those things that astronomers sometimes like to say. But how can this be true? Well, it kind of depends on how you define a photon. If you take a very strict particle physics definition of a photon as the carrier of the electromagnetic force, well, yes, of course there are photons inside of a star. If, on the other hand, you think of photons in our more everyday experience with light, which is to say a bunch of particles with a continuous frequency spectrum bouncing around all over the place, then there are no photons in stars. A more accurate description of what's going on in stars is that you have collective modes of the electromagnetic field coupled to plasma oscillations. If you don't know what this means, don't worry about it. It's not really relevant and it's well beyond the scope of this video. But collective modes is something that comes up in the mathematics of waves when those waves are under certain constraints. The point of this is not really whether or not photons exist in stars or not but is to point out that this idea of photons bouncing around like pinballs is just fundamentally inaccurate as to the behavior of light inside of stars. Nevertheless, it's still an interesting calculation that does give us a coarse grain and very rough estimate of the timescales of radiative heat transport within the star. If you found this video interesting, please subscribe and hit the notification bell and stay tuned for Stellar Physics 1C, where I will be discussing stellar luminosities.